Joining us now in studio, Dr. Prabhat Jha. He is Canada Research Chair of Health and Development at the University of Toronto, and we're happy to have you in that chair to talk about the missing girls of India. This is quite a horrendous story, but you're going to help us understand it a little bit better because you recently did a study that looked at mm -hmm. abortion based on sex mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. What did you find out? Well, we found that there are about 4 to 12 million girls aborted before birth from 1980 to 2010. And of that, about 3 to 6 million were just in the last decade. So 30-year totals of about uh, 12 million or up to 12 million girls aborted before birth. Half of that in the last decade. What is the ratio now between boys and girls in India? Well, this is, was the surprising thing in the 2011 census. The ratio of uh, girls to boys at age 0 to 6 had fallen down to about 914 girls for every thousand boys. Now, people were expecting that uh, those numbers would actually improve. And I, like many researchers, were quite shocked when the numbers showed, in fact, it was getting worse. So that quickly prompted us to dust off some research that we had, uh, had going and produce this uh, analysis. Presumably, all things being equal, it should be 1,000 to 1,000, right? It should be. That uh, in most populations, the normal ratio of boys to girls is a, between 950 to 975 girls to boys, meaning there's slightly more boys, but it's, it's close to 50-50. And that it doesn't really matter on the order of birth. Um, People commonly think that girls run in families or boys run in families, but it's actually not true. Uh, the chances of having a boy or a girl are 50-50 each time. So if it's 914 to 1,000 mm -hmm. girls to boys in India, what is it in Canada, just by way of comparison? Canada, it's right smack in the middle, around 950 or 960 mm -hmm. per uh, uh, girls per 1,000 boys. Okay. And you did look at second children. Yeah. Why is that? Well... Uh, if you want to know the, what is happening in families, then you need to study the patterns of birth. So what we did is looked at 250,000 uh, births that occurred from 1990 to 2005 and looked at the birth histories. And what we found is for the first birth, there was very little uh, skewed birth ratio, meaning it was around 950, 960 or so, just exactly what you'd find in Canada. And similarly, for the second birth, if the first was a boy, then it was the same, nothing abnormal. But if the first child was a girl, then the sex ratio for the second child was low and fell over time. So it fell from about 906 girls to boys down to 836 girls to boys hmm. over that time period. What would you infer from that? What we'd infer is that basically families are letting nature decide the gender of the first. But if they get a first girl, then in a small minority of the pregnancies that follow, the uh, families will say, well, we want to have at least one boy. So they opt for selective abortion to, sel to abort a female, if it is a female, and then in the hopes that the subsequent pregnancy will be a boy. Okay, this is all very troubling. It is. And we need to understand it better. Yeah. Why would so many millions yeah. of female fetuses yeah. be aborted in India? Yeah. See, the, the, the study also showed that this drop in the second girl was greater in those that had 10 or more years of education, mothers with 10 or more years of education, and in those that were in the 20% of the richest houses versus the 20% poorer. So what we think is going on is that the preference for a boy hasn't changed over time. In fact, if you do surveys and ask how many are the ideal number of boys, it's very similar over time. It's similar between North and South India, and it's similar between rich and poor. But what has changed is the number of children being born has shrunk dramatically. So in 1990, it used to be on average uh, that uh, a woman would have 3.8 children. By 2008, or about now, it's down to 2.5. So when you get families' size shrinking, and you get... Which, uh, which some people would say is a good thing. Which is a good thing. In it, a country you know, of a billion four exactly. people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It reduces overall population growth. But when you get that, and boy preference is fixed, then the families that have the means and I mean, they all have the desire, but they have the means to select the abortion, meaning they've got income or enough education to find where to do this, they will do so. 
And I think that's what's going on. I, I, I think I read somewhere that, you know, back in the day, if you gave birth to a girl and it was your first child, you didn't want it, they'd just kill it. Yeah. But now with advanced technology, and that's you can right. tell, obviously, with ultrasound, yeah. uh, you just have an abortion instead that's of right. killing it. Uh, why do girls in India seem to be so much less valued than boys? Well, you know, I think it's, there's a subtlety there. Girls are valued in one sense. If you ask families, would they like a girl, they'll say yes. But boys are particularly valued. And I think the main driver is uh, to think that houses want uh, to have a boy to look after them in old age. You know, in, in the same way we buy RSPs to protect ourselves against old age, I think Indian families think we need a boy because that's our retirement plan. That, that's who's going to look after us when we're older. Because girls traditionally, when they get married, go off and live with their in-laws and look after their in-laws. Hmm. It's interesting. We take the exact opposite approach here. If you wanted somebody to take care of you in your old age here, yeah. you'd want a daughter, not that's a son. Right. That's right. <laughs> now, that's interesting. It is changing somewhat in urban areas and uh, the like, with particularly with women getting into the workforce. They're earning enough income so that now they can actually have the proposition that we're going to look after both sets of parents. So it is changing, but not very fast. Let me read you this excerpt from a couple of years ago in the New York Times that spoke mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. Nick Kristoff, people will know, and and Cheryl Wudun is uh, the co-author on this. In places where girls have a deeply unequal status, yeah. they vanish, partly because they don't get the same health care and mm -hmm. food as boys. In India, for example, girls are less likely to be vaccinated than boys yes. and are taken to the hospital only when they are sicker. Mm -hmm. A result is that girls in India from one to five years of age are 50% more likely to die than boys their age. That's right. Now, you know, that seems to fly in the face of what you just said, which is girls are valued, it's just that boys are valued more. Yeah. This does not sound like girls are valued at all. Well, uh, what Nick has written is true, and our own research has found that girls uh, between the ages of one month to 59 months, or up to five years, do have a higher death rate than, uh, than boys. But the overall totals there are about 150,000 excess girl deaths at those ages. But you have to remember in the first month of life, for biologic reasons, boys have a higher mortality rate. So there's about 130,000 excess boy deaths in the first month of life. So you balance those together, and the overall difference between boy and girl deaths are actually small in India. Now, in our calculations, we took that factor into account, that if there were more girls born, they would be at higher death rates. But even bearing that in mind, you still end up that the main driver of the number of missing girls is before birth. It's feticide, and it's not the neglect of children after birth. Help us understand some of the, um, the local cultural implications of all of this. Yeah. I mean, there, there are dowries involved. There are inheritance laws. Yes. How do those you know, play out in this? Well, that's certainly part of it. And you know, the expression in India that's commonly said is having a daughter is like watering your neighbor's garden. I mean, why would you do so? Um, and why, why is it like that? Well, the sense that they don't actually contribute anything to your own, own house, that when they grow up, they will be uh, married off and will be basically contributing to someone else's house. So uh, that's been part of the dynamic, and dowry is part of it. Um, but you have to remember that our findings here, that the practice is most common in those that are educated and the richest, are precisely the groups in which these factors like dowry and the like seem to be less important. So it, it is interesting and what it suggests that it's mainly driven by the idea that uh, in these upper income houses uh, or households, they want to have at least one boy. They call it balance, thinking, okay, I want now only two children, I want to make sure one is a boy. Uh, unlike me who has two daughters and I'm very happy with that they will make the choice that, well, we want this balance. Now, what happens is one house is, when they make a decision to balance, they don't balance the other way, meaning if they have two boys, they don't do anything about it. Hmm. So when you total those numbers up, then you get a net impact on society. You know, individual houses' decisions have an impact on the societal numbers, and that's what we're observing. But, but you're Canadian. Yeah. So you're, you're from Winnipeg originally, right? Yeah. So you're happy to have two daughters. You bet. It's, yeah. um, it's not the same in other places around the world. It's not. And uh, the, the nuance here is that uh, 
it is driven by a strong preference for having a boy. Now, one way to compare that actually is to look at the Indian versus the Chinese experience. In China, there are also a large number of missing girls, you know, about the same magnitude as in India. But that's been mainly a result of the one-child uh, policy, which is basically coercive. And when that occurs, then houses say, well, if we only have one child, we'll definitely want a son. Um, in India, there is no such coercive policy, but if in time houses decide, no, we don't even want two kids, we only want one kid, then that may be that you get this pressure not just to abort the second girl, but in fact the first girl. We don't see any evidence of that yet. You know, there's a bit of good news there, but that may come if family size really shrinks, particularly in the urban areas of India. Just wanted to follow up a question about language here, because mm -hmm. the, you know there are uh, there are groups in our society that say you don't abort a boy or a girl, you yeah. ab abort a male or female fetus. Yeah. But you've said abort boy girl. Yeah. Are you using that language purposefully in that case? I think it's just a matter of clarity or the like. It's, um, I don't take any position on whether uh, abortion should be uh, legal or not. I think on the whole, legal abortions do more harm, uh, or sorry, do more good than harm. And uh, I believe in reproductive rights. But what we're seeing here is the um, phenomenon of those individual choices or family choices having an impact on society. You know, it's not too dissimilar to the kind of things that happen when we don't look after our own um, waste in our backyard or we pollute or so forth. So there are externalities, as economists Got call them. It. And let's just clarify this as well, because uh, you know, if you came to this f fresh without knowing anything, mm -hmm. you would assume, okay, this happens among the undereducated, this happens right. in more rural areas, this happens, you know, and you'd, you'd put a whole bunch of different caveats all over it. Yeah. But that's not the case. It's not the it's case. It's across the it's board. Not, yeah. And in terms of education and income growth, we should welcome those because they do other good things. They empower women, they get more people into the workforce, they reduce child mortality after birth. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, the growth in income and education has probably contributed to the spread of selective abortion um, throughout India, mm -hmm. and that's what we've also seen. Okay, so the big question at this point is, uh, you know, you hear about this, many people hear about this, they're yeah. mortified. Yeah. Is the Indian government mortified about this? They are, and the, the Prime Minister and the President and all sorts of senior political leaders have spoken out against this practice. What are they doing about it? Well, they're, it's pretty tough because in India, 80% of the primary care occurs in an absolutely chaotic, unregulated private sector. And uh, it's very hard to regulate that. There is an official act, which was passed in 1994, that says you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to sex uh, determine and abort. But it's so easy to circumvent. You, know, you go to a doctor and if it's uh, a boy, they'll say, well, hand out the sweets, which is a traditional way of be celebrating an auspicious event. And if it's a girl, they'll stay silent. Or they do things like thumbs up or nothing. And the families get the signal as to what the gender is. Would a doctor, if a, if a woman is pregnant mm -hmm. and she comes forward for her ultrasound and mm -hmm. she discovers that she's having a girl, is it the practice for a doctor to either try to convince the woman not to abort if he's, he or she suspects that there's a sex abortion selectiveness yeah. going on here? Yeah, well, you know, it's what Salman Rushdie calls the Indian rule of relativity here, which everything goes to relatives. So one doctor <laughs> will do the ultrasound and refer to his cousin who will do the abortion. So it's, it's pure money making in that sense. But they, the doctors do so because the private sector is, of healthcare is so underregulated in India. It's not like the controls we have in Canada. And there are many horror stories about private care in India, not just around selective abortion. They have abortion on demand in India? Oh, yeah. There are no available. laws surrounding abortion? I mean, we have no abortion law in Canada. Do they have one there? No. They, uh, it's supposed to be for the health of the mother and then the judgment of the doctor and the patient, which I mm -hmm. think is... Right. It's the right way to look at abortion services. Uh, from your vantage point, does the government look like it is truly interested in changing this at all? They are, and they, they could do some things better. I mean, it's the, this act that they passed in 1994 has been probably ineffective nationally, but in parts of India it might well have worked. As mentioned after our 2006 uh, paper that came out, 
uh, and there was an outcry. And at that time, we said it was mainly in particular states in North and uh, Western uh, India. After that, uh, they seem to put more attention, and there seems to be some attenuation in those states. But what has happened is the practice has now spread such, such that most of India now lives in places where the practice is quite common, about 90 percent. And if all this happens in the shadows anyway, how is anybody able to do anything about it? Well, there are a few things that uh, uh, might be done. I mean, some of the governments are trying cash incentives, but again, bearing in mind that it's really the elites that are doing this uh, or leading this practice, let's say. It's not clear whether that would work. Uh, a very practical thing that might be done is to have the census 2011 data, which actually are quite remarkable. They surveyed a billion people, and they had 150 million forms filled out by nearly 3 million enumerators. So there are data on each locality, and I think publishing the results of those might well lead to local debate. That started to happen. For example, some of the journalists have jumped on East Delhi as a hotspot. So, you know, they go around and they look, where are the clinics? Where is this occurring? And it puts local attention. Pair that kind of information with the fact that there's a vibrant media and a civil society in India. And it might be one strategy to try to raise debate and to get local action. If nothing happens on this, and we start to see a society in India which for every thousand boys born, yeah. it's not 914 girls, but say 850 yeah. or 800, yeah. what are the long-term ramifications for Indian society about that? The truth is we don't know, but we can probably predict that there'd be huge social disturbances. I mean, we've seen that in parts of China where the practice has been much more acute, that you have a whole generation of young men that grow up without um, having brides to marry. And uh, in parts of India, they're, they're already importing brides from other parts of India. You could have the issues around um, um, women or men not being comfortable around women. So that can lead to issues like uh, violence or sexual violence or even spread of HIV. So uh, it's a small effect, but you multiply that over uh, a generation and you could really get big social disturbances that we just can't predict right now. Balance is important, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. And this is skewed. Yeah. Dr. Jha, it's good of you to come into TVO tonight and help us with this. Thanks very much. Happy to, Steve. Thank you.